Today on the Home Winemaking Channel, we're gonna talk about what I think is the craziest and probably the scariest technique in all of winemaking. If you like these kinds of winemaking videos and you wanna support the Home Winemaking Channel, make sure to swing by my Patreon page, patreon.com slash makewine, and you can become a patron, get some exclusive content, and donate as small as, you know, a dollar or two dollars to unlock that content. Now let's get into what this wild and crazy technique is. Now historically in white wine making, the conventional wisdom is you really want to pre prevent oxidation all the way through the process. So from the time you crush and press those grapes all the way until the time that wine goes into bottle, you really want to prevent oxidation. This usually involves a pretty heavy dose of sulfite at the time of crush. Um, that's going to help scavenge oxygen. It'll hold back little microbes. Um, it'll really suppress enzymes, things like that. And I mean, white wine is just really, really just wants to oxidize, especially when it's in the juice form, because it really has such low tannin content compared to your red wine that is just full of tannin from all those seeds and skins. Now, about 25 years ago, we started to kind of nail down uh, a new technique in white winemaking that is completely crazy and counterintuitive. And at a first glance, you're like, what in the world are you doing with this wine? Now, if you look at this wine behind me here, you might've seen me picking some grapes on a video just a week or so ago. Alvarino, white wine. A day ago though, this white wine was brown, completely brown. And if you look at it now, it's completely the exact color you would expect a white wine fermentation to be. You see it looks kind of milky. That's completely normal because we've got a lot of uh, solids up kind of floating around, pulp, yeast, things that are, haven't yet precipitated out of that wine. But when this wine is done, it's on track to be just your exact normal color wine. Now, why did I let this wine turn brown? How did it turn brown? And is it a good thing that it turned brown or a bad thing that it turned brown? Well, the process of intentionally oxidizing a white wine is called hyper oxidation. It's a, as I said, it's a relatively new technique in white wine making and what you're kind of doing is using oxidation to help reduce the chance of oxidation later on. So when this wine is in juice form, it's full of natural enzymes that really want to break things down and some of which get really, really active in the presence of oxygen. Like you look at a apple, when you cut it, all of a sudden it turns brown like that. You look at a um, banana, you pull it back, it just wants to turn brown. That is enzymatic oxidation as opposed to your more bacterial type oxidations or chemical type oxidations that you would see later on in a wine making process. So you, what you're doing here is you're leveraging these enzymes that are present and active in a juice but are really no longer active in a wine with alcohol. They just become pretty much incapable of doing their job once this wine has alcohol. And what I did was sulfited this to about 40 parts per million at the time of crush and press and put it in the fridge to cold settle. This is all pretty standard, but 40 parts per million when you're making wine at home with a basket press and you know a hand crank Crusher is a little bit of a low dose. If you watched my how to make white, white wine video last year, you might have seen a number like 75 parts per million. You figure you're probably gonna lose something like 15 to 20 parts per million just in that process of crushing and pressing. And by the time it sits for two days in the fridge, we can pretty much consider that sulfite to be completely wiped out. So I took that wine out of the fridge and um, allowed it to start to warm up, which is what you'll do to get the fermentation kicked off. I had racked it off the 
lees, which is what you're trying to do when you're cold settling. You kind of rack it off all that, those big particles that come in. And I started to kind of splash and churn this wine up. And this is the first time I've done microoxidation. I've read a lot about it. I've learned a lot about it. And holy cow, did it blow my mind how quick this wine went from a similar color to what you see now to brown, like chocolate milk brown. It is terrifying. You work so hard all year cultivating these grapes. You just do everything to baby these grapes. And then you see your, your juice just turn dark brown and you're like, oh no, oh no, what have I done? What happened when that wine turned dark brown is um, these enzymes are, you know, in the presence of oxygen in a juice going after these flavonoid phenols, which actually make a white wine somewhat um, bitter. So they can kind of hide that varietal character that you want. So this an Alvarino kind of has a, you know, pear like floral varietal character, but the more of these flavonoid phenols are in this wine, the more you're going to sort of, I would say, cover that up with these, you know, relatively astringent components. So you're oxidizing them with these enzymes, which are turning them into these brown insoluble pigments. And these pigments will settle out of the wine as it starts to ferment. They'll also be adsorbed by the yeast. So essentially they're just kind of going away. They're getting out of the wine. And now they're not available to oxidize later on. So when you put this wine in the bottle and you try to age it for, you know, a year maybe, those, um, you know, flavonoid phenols, they might start out as not really a big contributor to the wine, but as they start to slowly oxidize over time through a more chemical pathway, they start to become more and more noticeable. The threshold of when you're gonna start to, you know, smell or taste those starts to dip and dip and dip. And that's when you get this kind of negative oxidation in a wine. And it's also when you can start to see an actual bottle of white wine start to brown. So now the other half of this is gonna be, well, now what? You've introduced all this oxygen to your juice and you don't wanna kick off these other types of oxidation like your you know, vinegar type bacteria, your acetaldehydes, your things that, or your acetobacters that wanna create things like your acetaldehyde and um, ethyl acetate, these really negative contributors to a wine. We've got all this oxygen, are they gonna start to do things? Well, the answer is actually probably not. And the reason why is yeast is really, really reductive. So it's essentially the opposite of an oxidizing uh, reaction. It's consuming all kinds of oxygen just to get by. You'll often find that in winemaking, you actually have to give that wine a little bit of oxygen just to keep that yeast happy. When the yeast doesn't have enough oxygen, it'll produce stinky sulfides like hydrogen sulfide. It smells like rotten eggs. So what ends up happening is this hyper oxidized must, aside from this, you know, enzyme taking on these flavonoids, using up a lot of that oxygen, that yeast will just slam this thing right back into equilibrium so quick from the time I added my yeast starter to this after this wine was brown, you know, probably within about an hour, you already started to see improvements. It's been about 24 hours. And if you compare what we see here to a picture from 24 hours ago, night and day, completely, totally different looking wine and I'm no longer scared anymore. <laughs> So how do they hyper oxidize a wine at these wineries? There's a few different things they can do. They can simply just let it drain from the press really nice and slow. Usually they'll completely unsulfide it from the start. Um, they can also bubble air through after they've pressed this juice. 
They can bubble pure oxygen through. They're gonna need a lot less because air is you know, only about 20% oxygen. Um, they've got a few techniques and they're gonna be a lot more analytical about it than me. They've got a lot more to lose. So they're gonna use their lab and make sure they don't overdo it. For me, I'm just watching this thing and as soon as it starts turning brown, it's game time to stop applying any oxygen to that and um, get that yeast on it and try to essentially swing the reaction back the other way. Is this something you should be doing with your white wines at home? The jury's still out, to be, to be honest. Um, stylistically, there's no doubt that this is going to be slightly different than a wine that is made with the completely traditional, you know, anaerobic more style of white winemaking. What I expect to see is a much, probably slightly more fruit driven wine with virtually none of these astringent um, components. So it's gonna probably be a really, really easy drinking wine. Now, is that something you want? I don't know. I, I'm, what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna compare this to this same wine that I made last year. Of course, they're gonna be a year different, so I'm gonna have to try to especially use my memory to remember what that wine was like at that same time. And there's gonna be some differences each year. The climate's a little bit different. So it's gonna, it's gonna be hard to compare, but what we'll see is these wild stylistic differences by doing these comparisons. My probably best advice would be though, if you're just getting into winemaking, start by using the traditional methods. And when you start getting bored with that and you wanna start branching out, try things like this, um, hyper oxidation. This can also be something you might do if you're making apple cider hard apple cider. Now the difference with apple cider is going to be, it's, it's probably going to be a lot harder to actually prevent it. Most likely you're going to grind up those apples and it's going to be turning brown already. So this is something that cider makers, they just kind of do it. It's not something they're stylistically trying to do. It's not necessarily an advanced technique. It's just something that's already happening with those hard apple ciders. I hope you like this video. Stay tuned for lots of new winemaking videos. We're coming into peak winemaking season. Obviously winemaking is a really seasonal thing, but in peak wine season, I've got so much stuff going on. I've got 2000 pounds of grapes coming between me and some of my winemaking buddies. I've got another 500 pounds coming off the backyard. I've got some growers that um, help me out and will give me some grapes and I'm upgrading my wine press. There's a lot of stuff you're gonna see from the Home Winemaking channel this fall, so make sure to stay tuned. As always, if you wanna see some more content, um, swing by my website, smartwinemaking.com. If you have experience with hyperoxidation, which I find to be really, really hard to find information on, please share it in the comments. Or if you think you might give this a try, Share it in the comments. We can try to crowdsource some information to help us all with these crazy winemaking techniques. Thanks for watching.